I think we can start. Uh, I'm very happy to, to open this, uh, uh, the first uh, lecture in our uh, new series. And I'm really, really excited to see that we have uh, listeners and participants from uh, all over the globe. Some answered in the chat, some uh, uh, said where they're from. And uh, uh, this lecture will take us, it will take us from Africa. We have some listeners from South Africa. So this lecture will take us from uh, South, uh, not from South Africa, uh, but from East Africa to the Levantine Corridor, uh, introducing the first humans that uh, entered Israel and that later populated uh, the entire old world. So the reason uh, we are focusing on the Hula Valley, which you will see uh, on a map shortly, is uh, because this area uh, hosts uh, the earliest archaeological sites known in Israel. And those sites are uh, evidence for a process known as the out of Africa um, migration process, a process that started uh, almost two million years ago, uh, where early humans uh, left the African continent for the first time with their material culture and their traditions uh, regarding how to do different things. And uh, they went out of Africa, uh, probably uh, the, as the Levantine corridor serving as their main uh, route out of Africa. But it is also likely that they used uh, other migration routes and those early humans uh, arrived uh, all over the old world. They have arrived to Asia, uh, to Europe, and uh, we find their material culture all over uh, uh, Asia, Europe, and uh, uh, the Levant, of course. So the, what is marked on the map that you can see are the probable routes that these early humans used. And another thing you can see on the map is what some of us know as the second wave out of Africa. What I will be talking about today uh, is referred to in the dotted lines, those routes or likely uh, routes that took humans from the African continent throughout the Levantine corridor or uh, Arabia and uh, allow them to spread all over the globe. And what you see in the blue arrows refers to the second out of Africa migration, that of the Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, modern humans, a process that occurred uh, some 40,000 years ago, and we will not be discussing it today. So who are these people? who left Africa, arrived in our area, and later uh, occupied most of the world. Uh, they are known generally as Homo erectus, even though in different areas of the world they can be referred to different names, but they all belong to a, a general group under Homo erectus, or the erected man. And sadly, when we look for the remains of these humans uh, in Israel, we find very, very little evidence. Um, we find in, in, in the entire assemblage of archaeological sites in Israel, we have only one fragment of a skull from this, this period. It is known as uh, the Galilee Man, and it is uh, presented at the Israeli Museum. And we know of two fragments of uh, leg bones and some teeth, more than this image uh, presents. We now have more teeth, but clearly it's not enough to establish uh, accurately how these people look like. And we are based on um, um, reconstructions from other areas in the world where these humans occur. And the only reason actually that we, we, we 
think that, or we suggest that it was Homo erectus that arrived here is because of the material culture that these humans bring with them. They don't come on their own. They come with some sort of cultural package. They, maybe they do not carry suitcases, but they do carry uh, their material culture, which expresses in the way they modify their tools and their way of life. Uh, and the material culture is a marker to those populations and we can follow it throughout the world. So what is this material culture? It is called as the Achillean culture. And the Achillean culture is characterized mostly by this type of tool. This is a hand ax, which I happen to have one here in my hands, if you wanna have a look. It is a bifacial tool. It has two faces which meet in a very sharp cutting edge that can be used to various uh, tasks of digging and uh, cracking and butchering. And these hand axes, these teardrop hand axes are characteristic of the Achillean culture. We can follow them, those hand axes, and actually follow the migration routes of these populations. So the Achillean culture uh, is known from Africa and later Asia and Europe uh, from about uh, 1.8 million years ago, which is not shown here, sorry, until quarter of a million years ago. And in Israel, we know it uh, as early as the earliest site of Israel, which is the site of Ubedia in the Hula Valley. And uh, later in the site of Gesher Benot Yaakov, and later in a variety of other sites until similarly until a quarter of a million years ago when the Achillean culture um, disappears and is replaced by other populations with different material cultures. So what we will discuss today very briefly is these two sites which actually represent the earliest uh, phases of uh, human occupation uh, in our area. We will see the site of Ubedia, the earliest site here south of the Sea of Galilee, and the site of Gesher Benot Yaakov, uh, north of the Sea of Galilee. These two sites actually present two migration waves. The out of Africa process is not a single uh, uh, process. It's not a single event. It is an accumulation of events that we cannot track them precisely, but we can track uh, uh, the characteristics of different phases. And the earliest phase that we recognize is the one we find in Ubedia. Ubedia is south of Lake Kinneret, the Sea of Galilee, and it is currently in, uh, on the fields of a kibbutz, Kibbutz Afikim, uh, if some of you were driving around Israel, uh, uh, the Tzemach Junction, south of the Sea of Galilee, um, this is where this kibbutz is situated, situated. And in the 60s, when the people of this kibbutz were attempting to excavate a fish ponds, they came across very large bones that suggested that a very early site might be present in this area. And people from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem came over because this was practically the only active universities, uh, university during this time. And what they found out is that Ubedia, this uh, site, uh, occupies very early evidence that is so early that it went uh, tectonic uh, deformations. And actually what we see here, you see this guy is standing on an anticline. This is the joining point of layers that were tilted. You can have a look at my hand now. This is a horizontal surface that humans can walk on. But because we are situated on the African Rift Valley, yes, this, the, the Jordan Valley, what happens is that the tectonic activity lifts those layers, lifts them, and 
tilt them. So when archaeologists come to excavate, if they will attempt to excavate from top to bottom, like every reasonable archaeologist, they will encounter truncated uh, horizons. They have to excavate tilted horizons. So if you will have a look at my cursor, this tilted horizon used to be horizontal, but it is now tilted and so forth. Um, soon you will see an image of the excavation and you, you will have a better understanding of what I'm saying. Uh, and unlike the very dry climate, very hot and dry climate that characterizes the area today, actually it's not that dry, but it's very hot, uh, in antiquity and during prehistoric times, there used to be a lake, a sweet water lake, which is always when you find a prehistoric site, we should always remember that it is very likely that some sort of water source was in the area because humans tend to sit uh, in the vicinity of water, which they need for their survival. So one and a half million years ago, near the Sea of Galilee, there used to be a sweet water lake and rivers used to flow into its direction. We can uh, learn about it from the sediments where the material culture are, is embedded alongside with various animal remains that do, uh, th those people ate. So this is what I mean when I say tilted horizons. Yes, they were lifted. And this is why when we come to excavate those horizons, we actually uh, excavate walls, yes, that are some 70 degrees um, tilted. And all those, what seems to you like pebbles, yes, some of these are uh, river and, and uh, lake pebbles, but some of these are napped tools and bones, which we can not see very clearly, and, but we will see soon. And you can see that during the 60s, people were not aware to the damages of sun as they are today. So this is why it looks like it does. So uh, the material culture of Ubaidiyah, you remember, yeah, those bifaces that are held in, in the fist uh, very easily. So this is what we find in Ubaidiyah. We find it on basalts and we find it on flint and alongside those hand axes, which are markers of the Chilean culture, we also find other tools which we which characterize those ancient um, material cultures. We have chopping tools like this and all kinds of uh, spherical tools, which we can only imagine what they were used for. Um, like those spheroids and those polyhedrons. When we look at the animals, the fossil uh, animals of Ubidia, we find a very rich assemblage that is characterized by African animals from one side and by uh, animals of Eurasian uh, origin. So we have monkeys and giraffes and hippos and uh, zebras or some sort of horses uh, that are uh, of African origin and they are known from African sites uh, of, of this age. But we also have other animals which are not of African origin, but are known from sites in Asia and in Europe. Uh, and it's, it illustrates in a very nice way the, the fact that migration routes were open and just as those giraffes found their way uh, from Africa to our area, so did the, those early humans had open migration routes that they could uh, uh, walk through and arrive in our area. Um, this is an example of one of those animals. It's an, it's, it's an extinct animal that uh, do not longer exist anywhere in the world. It is called Pelorovis. It is a giant cattle. It's a giant uh, uh, um, 
cow that the length of its uh, uh, horns can reach two meters, over two meters. And this is how it looks during excavation. And we have to wonder every time we look at prehistoric sites, we always have to wonder whether everything we look at is natural or naturally embedded because we have a lake and animals can come to the lake and die there and humans can go through the lake and nap some tools and it does not necessarily mean that there is a connection between those animals and those humans. So what prehistorians do is look for evidence for the involvement of those humans in the animal assemblage. And this is an example for such an involvement. It's called cut marks because the using of uh, flint tools and other stone tools to deflesh the animal leaves distinctive marks on the bones that can teach us that humans were involved uh, in defleshing those animals and they did not uh, uh, occur them occur there accidentally. So this was the earliest evidence of human presence uh, in Israel, the earliest known uh, archaeological sites. It used to be the oldest site out of Africa. It used to provide the date for the out of Africa process. Uh, but in the late 90s, um, they started working in uh, uh, Georgia and found a site called the Manisi, which is dated to 1.8 million years ago. So currently the, the, the age of 1.8 million years ago for the out of Africa process is based on the Georgian site and not on our site. So we lost our uh, fame in this regard. Uh, but this early uh, site of Ubedia uh, is just an example of one migration way. Now we will have a look a bit to the north. We are moving uh, uh, from Lake Kinneret along the Jordan River and we arrive at what is known as the Benot Yaakov bridges, the bridges that take us on this road to the Golan Heights. But you can uh, see in this picture that the color of the uh, shore of the Jordan River here is very white. This white color is actually a geological formation uh, filled with uh, mollusks, grind mollusks. And it is inside this formation that we have the remains of another uh, site of a second wave uh, out of Africa. It is known as Gesher Benot Yaakov, named after those bridges. And you can also see that very similarly to Ubedia, this is also a site that went through uh, uh, tectonic activity that deformed the, the strata and we actually excavate tilted strata instead of horizontal strata. Another thing that you can see is all these water. Today, these water are coming from the Jordan River, but actually the site of Geshev Not Yaakov throughout its entire, uh, from the minute it was embedded until it was discovered in, um, and excavated, uh, it was always submerged in sweet water. It was sub submerged in water when it was on the shores of the Paleo Lake Hula. And it was later submerged in water, even when Paleo Lake Hula uh, uh, shrank and went to the north. But th those sediments uh, were always submerged in water. And as a result of that, we have the earliest example of botanical remains uh, from the Hula Valley, which some of them we will see uh, very shortly. Uh, so the Hula Valley, the Jordan River, and let's have a look of what these people uh, brought with them when they came to Gesher Benot Yaakov. They didn't bring uh, the same material culture that we saw in Ubedia. 
because these are different people. They are not ancestors of the Ubidia people. They are African or uh, people that their ancestors are African and it took them several genera generations to arrive at Geshe Bnot Yaakov. But what they did in Geshe Bnot Yaakov is much more similar to what we know from Africa than what we know from Ubidia. So this is another way. And we have a look, we, we are looking at one uh, occupation level. There are a series of occupation levels uh, because this lake, Palo Lake Hula, was very attractive for those people. They had a lot of vegetation, and animals coming to drink from the water. So um, they settled there repeatedly. So we have a series of occupation levels. In this one, we see an elephant skull. It is upside down. So we look at the back of the skull and we can see a wooden log. It's an oak log that was preserved nearly 800,000 years. This is the age of Geshev Yaakov, if I haven't mentioned it. Uh, and those people likely wanted to use the, what, what was in the skull for uh, dietary purposes. Yes, they probably attempted to reach the brain, which is very rich in fat and calories. Um, we can argue about the flavor, but I have never tried it, so I don't know. And all around the skull and the wood log, we can see different uh, stone tools, such as this basalt hand axe. Yes, the Achelian marker of the hand axe. So uh, the interpretation of uh, Naama Goronimba, who excavated the site, suggests that those early humans attempted to reach the brain and they used the wooden log as a leverage to move this very heavy skull. Uh, apart from the elephants, we know from Gesher Bonot Yaakov uh, uh, a lot of uh, remains of large mammals, medium mammals, uh, very similar to what we saw in Ubidia, some of them of African origin, some of uh, Eurasian origin, some are characteristic of uh, water, yes, a lake environment, and some of wooden environment. So it can give us the general view of uh, the environment around this lake. And along with these very large and medium-sized mammals, we also have the remains of very small animals like fish and, and uh, um, crabs. And we can imagine that the people of Geshe Bnot Yaakov uh, had um, a very rich uh, the choice of, uh, of uh, resources. In some of the cases, as I said previously, we have to wonder and attempt to prove the association between those remains, which may be natural, such as the catfish and the carps, which we find today in, uh, in the Sea of Galilee, in Lake Kinneret. It's the same, the same species of fish that we have today, but we need to um, establish the connection between those fish and the human occupation and not merely uh, uh, assume that people were eating those fish. And I hope that later in a few minutes, uh, I will show you this association. Uh, as the, for the botanical remains, you saw the wooden log. Now we see more examples of wooden logs and even a piece of wood which was, um, that may have been um, modified in some way, but we can't investigate it deeply because this particular piece uh, was sent to the uh, Israeli museum and it was lost there, but it is a reminder of the possibilities that uh, wood uh, may have been used uh, as a raw material for a variety of wooden tools, 
but we do not have any other example from the site, even though we have a lot of uh, wooden uh, wood remains. So you saw the very big uh, remains uh, of wood, and we also have very, very small remains, seeds and fruits and nuts of a variety of uh, species that gives us uh, uh, a view of the environment. We know that those humans had around them, they had grapes and they had olives, they had almonds and uh, oaks and pears and cherry trees and a lot of different types of um, uh, trees and shrubs. And most of them are still common in the Hula Valley and some of them are extinct uh, as this uh, uh, prickly water lily and th those trapanatans, uh, which are both nuts that used to, uh, both are water nuts that used to occupy the Hula, uh, the Paleo Hula Lake, and that may have been consumed uh, by these uh, early humans. Uh, and the last thing I want to tell you about uh, Geshe Amnot Yaakov is the, the fact that those early humans, some 800,000 years ago, uh, used fire to, to, for a variety of purposes. Um, and we know that this site has evidence for the use of fire because we find burned debris which originates from napping, such as napping such hand axes. The process of napping stone uh, leaves a huge amount of micro uh, flakes, micro wastes, as you can see from this experimental napping, a lot, a lot of small waste. And it Geshem Not Yaakov, amongst these small waste that we've collected, there was a small fraction, no more than 2% of thousands and thousands of uh, small flint waste, a very small fraction that was burned. And burning uh, is very easily identifiable because the exposure of flint to high temperatures results in these very typical fractures uh, that we can see in this picture. So what we had to do in order to determine the use of fire at such an early site, we mapped uh, in each of the occupational levels of this site, we mapped the distribution of burned uh, fragments. And we assumed that if it was a natural fire that damaged uh, those flints, uh, so it will be everywhere or it will damage wherever there was flint to be damaged. But if we will find concentrations of burning, we may have uh, uh, actually find the locations of ancient hearth, ancient fireplaces, because if humans were sitting around a fireplace and around this fireplace, they were um, napping, preparing stone tools, they were deflashing animals, maybe they were roasting some fish, maybe they were cracking um, different types of nuts, and all this debris of their activity is concentrated around the fireplace. And some of the debris may have been burned, exposed to high temperatures. And these burned fragments will mark for us the location of these fireplaces. And this is actually what happened. We were able to trace the uh, location of fireplaces. This is how it looks like in one of something like 13 occupation levels. This is one example. We saw an example of the elephant. It was one occupational uh, level. And this is another occupational level. We can see the mapping of the burnt flint, suggesting a fireplace in this location. And here we can see the same fireplace or 
it is more of a phantom fireplace because it is not really there. It is suggested by the distribution of burning. But we can see that if we take the field map, what we saw during excavation, the different wood pieces and hand axes and other napped material, and we overlay it on the concentration of burning, it is suggested that there was a lot of activity around this fireplace. For example, this triangular piece is actually an anvil, a basalt anvil, on which people could, very similarly to what we know from hunter-gatherers today, could nap the nuts after roasting them in the fire. You know that roasting nuts is essential if we want to uh, eliminate some of the toxins uh, in these nuts. So the proximity of nut processing and fire is ethnographically known and we find it as early as 800,000 years ago at Geshev Not Yaakov. Another interesting thing is that all those thousands uh, bones of fish that I showed an example of them uh, a minute ago, when we map the remains of the fish, they overlap with the remains of the fireplace, suggesting that the fish were not uh, naturally embedded at the site, but were collected or fished by those early humans and either roasted or thrown to the fire, uh, resulting in that, uh, in, in this distribution of them uh, concentrated in the fireplace. So thank you. And I hope uh, you have some sort of a vivid uh, image of groups of early humans sitting on a lake shore and enjoying the wealth that the Hula Valley uh, had always suggested. And uh, soon we can all travel around the Hula Valley and enjoy it again. So thank you very much. And uh, before we proceed to any questions, uh, I would like to tell those of you who are interested, uh, I would like to tell you about our international program uh, if you want to expand on your studies and join us at uh, Barilan University uh, starting next year, we will suggest um, MA and PhD uh, uh, studies with uh, a variety of scholars, uh, experts of biblical archaeology and archaeobotany and so forth. Um, of course, you can take my classes as well. I can always tutor you in English. Uh, so you are all welcome. Thank you. Mira? Ken, yes. Hey, there was a question about the catfish. Is the catfish now in Hula the same catfish that we uh, have in uh, Geshev Not Yaakov? Yes, it's the same catfish. Uh, also in the in Lake Hula, actually, we have catfish, and in Lake Kinneret we have the same catfish. The carps uh, were much bigger than the ones we know today. The carps we know today are uh, different. Uh, the woman who uh, uh, analyzed the this amazing assemblage is. Uh, Irit Zohar, Dr. Irit Zohar. She had to go through thousands and thousands of very tiny uh, remains uh, and identified uh, those species. So the carps actually are much more interesting than the catfish because the carps we have in Geshev Not Yaakov are, I can say, giant. They are almost two meters long. So each fish could provide. Uh, a, a lot of uh, meat for a lot of people. So it makes you wonder uh, how many people could uh, actually live there. Okay, there was a question about the uh, Ubadiyah chronology. If, if you can repeat uh, the dates 
And yes. also a question, uh, the cave in uh, Kesem Cave near uh, Rosh Ein, how did it change our uh, uh, beliefs about the um, first humans coming to Israel? Okay, so let's start with the dating. The dating of Ubedia uh, is uh, primarily based on the geological formation that this assemblage is embedded in. Uh, the, the Jordan Valley uh, is characterized by a sequence of uh, basalt flows and geological formations that can be dated independently. And the site of Ubedia is embedded inside a geological formation called the Ubedia formation. So the initial date comes from there, but it is also um, uh, it is also correlated with the uh, animal remains that are characterized, particular species that we know that uh, persisted in uh, uh, certain time frames. Uh, so this is what gives Ubedia its uh, age. Uh, it is 1.4, some people say 1.5 million years ago. Um, this is about the Ubedia chronology. Uh, Kesem Cave. Kesem Cave is, um, is a remarkable site uh, near Rosh Ha'ain, if uh, you're familiar, uh, uh, that is dated to 350,000 years ago, on average, or 300,000 years ago, which, if you remember the chronology, it's the end of the Ashelian culture. It is uh, it is a site that is not strictly Ashelian. It is called Ashelo Yabrudian. Um, and it provides, uh, it, um, um, that this particular material culture of Kesem Cave is not of African origin. So it is not necessarily uh, 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 represent another wave of, of migration out of Africa, but it is very likely that these populations are populations that evolved here for many generations. Mm -hmm. Those of Kessen. Okay, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And you can tune in tomorrow for Professor Aaron Mayer's lecture and the rest of the lectures in this series. Thank you to Professor Nira Alperson Afil.